I've been in the BBC um, ooh, many years, 16, 17 years, something like that. I joined for two, uh, forgot how to leave. Um, I turned up making TV trails, ended up setting up the accessibility team in, in the digital division because there wasn't one and, uh, and um, it was something that at the time, um, you know, there, there were huge problems and uh, I have, by the way, I have ADHD, dyslexia and other stuff uh, going on. Uh, I like to usually describe myself as a bag of cognitive conditions that walks around the BBC. Um, according to a member of my team, uh, in a BBC training video, which I hadn't seen until I was stood on the stage at an event at, uh, at the BBC, uh, while this video was being played, they said, they all knew that I was their line manager, and they said, yes, of course, well, you know, my, line, my boss, well, he's probably autistic too. And everyone in the room just went and looked at me. So, um, yes, that's a little bit about me. Still not diagnosed yet, but I need to have a look into that. Um, so I, uh, ooh, yes, ADHD, dyslexia. <laughs> it's funny, that, that next slide just reminded me. So one of the things I have is absolutely no short-term memory whatsoever. Um, and uh, I wrote these slides. I can't really remember much of what's in them. Um, so they're mostly there to remind me of what I should be talking about, which is quite funny because in the next 30 minutes anything could happen. I'd actually forgotten I'd written that slide. So this is going to be a journey for everyone, <laughs> including me. Um, and uh, yes, uh, so I yeah, manage three, arguably three teams. Uh, head of uh, user experience and design, I'm one of the, I think, eight heads of. Uh, we're in a management team managing about 200 people in a division of 2,000 uh, largely engineering folk. There's a lot of neurodiversity within that group both diagnosed and undiagnosed. It's a very, it's a fascinatingly brilliant place to work. Um, I'm gonna talk about being a manager of people. I'm a, I'm a manager at the end of the day. This is where I've ended up. I've gone through the route of being sort of, I've always struggled with being called a creative. It's a really odd thing to, to call yourself a, a creative. It's not, crea a, crea a creative isn't a thing. It's like being a wonderful, <laughs> you know, so you can't, you can't. But anyway, um, so I've come in through that creative route and ended up managing people. And, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the approaches and strategies. I'm uh, going to do a bit of a disclaimer as well. This is all about, and Jamie's always taught me to do these disclaimers. Did anyone see Jamie talk here a couple of years ago? Can I do a bit of a show of hands? Good, right, okay. I was really hoping that some hands would go up because then they would re re remember some of the stuff. But I'll try and fill in for everyone else a little bit about Jamie. I won't talk about what Jamie talks about, um, but I will kind of uh, uh, slightly cross over in a few places. But Jamie's always taught me to do a disclaimer in all, all of my presentations. You know, this is about... This is very much about what works within our team, what works with an individual, and I'm going to talk about Jamie, uh, and uh, because many of you have met him, and um, and sort of our last sort of five plus years of working together. Uh, it's interesting me being ADHD and dyslexic, and him being autistic, that he really needs structure, and I can't spell it. Um, <laughs> it's so, but we muck in, in together, and I also move around a lot, knock things over. ADHD is a really unusual thing. I heard it described beautifully quite recently. It's like being in a world where your world is 30 television sets. They've all got different programs on. You didn't choose anyone, and someone's got their else has got the remote control and keeps switching the channels. And, uh, and it's like that. Most of me, my brain is constantly looking at things and going, have a look at that, have a look at that. There's a great big cross behind you. It won't ignore that. It's <laughs> since I've got up there. I know it's there, and for some reason, I can't ignore it. But anyway... Um, being a manager, what does that effectively mean? Right, okay. Um, right. It's actually, this, this is what I wanted to really talk about. Um, I, I have, uh, yes, quite a, a, a very neurodivergent team, um, and a uh, neurodiverse team, sorry. And, um, and some of the things, one of the things, I, it's a little sort of mantra, I suppose, is, is someone on my team is willing and able to do their job, and yet they can't do it. It's the responsibility of the manager to resolve that problem. Um, you know, if people come to work to you, I, I, I hire people or I end up working with people who are brilliant, who are clever, who are enthusiastic, who have incredible specialisms and insights. And if something is breaking them, my job is to remove that. It's not their job to do that. And uh, I'm going to talk about some of the situations and things that, where this has arisen and, and some of the ways we do it. And you have to be very, very creative in this approach. You know, there's no 
tick box checklist of stuff that you need to do. <laughs> Weirdly enough, I'm ending up with a checklist. Um, but there is stuff that is kind of quite general of where you can start as starting points. But really, when you're talking about individuals, you have to get into the into the, the sort of crux of what the problem is and then work with people to creatively come up with um, solutions. Oh, yeah, so my, my core team around accessibility, there's 11 people plus me uh, plus one, which is Lion. Uh, Lion is the head of antelope management at the BBC. Uh, I can safely say for the seven years he's been there, I haven't seen a single antelope. It's a you know, very, now if you want efficiency, um, that's brilliant. So uh, Lion is very much part of our team. Um, our team, we deal with the BBC's technical guidelines, which we, we own a lot of them. Um, we do a lot of engineering and user experience research. We deliver a lot of training, that's training courses and training to large groups. We have uh, nearly 200 accessibility champions in our division, which we build their specialism up within their job. Um, part of our team does evaluations around procurement. It's a very, very mixed and varied group of, of skill sets and responsibilities, and we work across internal systems, virtual reality um, stuff that the BBC is building, um, our voice services on, on various sort of spoken platforms, mobile apps, all sorts of stuff. As I said before, three declared with ASD, um, I, I'm, you know, <laughs> once, once you start spotting the traits, you just th it's a very difficult thing as a manager is to approach that when someone isn't declared, but you still can put a lot of strategies in place and you should support people. I mean, particularly people like me who left school long before 1989 when there was no, you know, no, no one got, got, got diagnosed. I mean, I, I didn't have formal diagnosis for any of my conditions until I was, you know, sort of way into my late 30s. Um, and it's just one of those things, you know, it's uh, I, being with, you know, it's ADHD and dyslexic, you know, I was always in the bottom set. Um, every single one of my school reports started, Gareth is a nice boy, but, and it was just a list that was only, I, I discovered quite early on in those days, because they're all handwritten reports, was the best thing to do was to burn them. And uh, because the, the, the telling off you get for burning it rather than the telling off you got them for reading it <laughs> was far less. They had no idea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> creative strategies, folks. Um, so, on to Jamie. <laughs> Sorry about this. Some small tangents happening. Um, Jamie, and uh, this is lying down the bottom. Uh, obviously, some of you know. Uh, Jamie um, already worked at the BBC when I met him. Um, I met him in an incredibly unusual night. I knew of him. I mean, within our field, he's well known as a specialist anyway. He'd come and was working in radio and music, and he was an, it's an incredible uh, technical lead um, there. I think he's probably the youngest lead developer we've ever had, and he was about 23, 24 at the time. Uh, no formal qualifications in anything that he does. He's just brilliant. Um, and uh, I think the first day I met him was on Children in Need Day. He'd, he'd, I turned up at one of the BBC buildings and, and Jamie had come in in a, in a lion onesie carrying a lion on Children Need Day and there was Pudsey and Pudsey went, that guy needs a hug. <laughs> that guy did not need a hug. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, and I was presented with this image of a man in a onesie carrying, a uh, lion onesie carrying a lion running away from a large yellow bear. And I paused for a moment and I thought, I've just got to take this in. This has got to sink in. Before I rescue him, this is... <laughs> it was extraordinary. And, and we've been very close ever since. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, he came in, uh, pretty much built the iPlayer radio app. Has anyone used, did you use the iPlayer radio app? You've, you've used Jamie's work. Jamie built that. He worked with a, a brilliant uh, creative director um, uh, called Sasha Cedrics, who's, who's gone back to California now. And they basically built a prototype and it was so good, it ended up being developed into a, into a full-blown product. It was, it was brilliant. So you've, you've already experienced what Jamie can do. Obviously, it's accessibility specialist um, and was well-known. I knew him by reputation. Awesome developer, um, which I've spelled completely wrong because I'm dyslexic. And, uh, and comes with a free line. Jamie, I'm going to nick uh, aside. This is what we, we, we do quite a lot of public speaking together, uh, quite often. I usually sit down the front um, and uh, to make sure he doesn't get fired for what he says. Um, we, we regularly check. He looks at me and goes, I've still got a job. I've still got a job. Um, and if I ever need to stand up and, and shout, this is not the opinion of the BBC, I have done that a few times. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But he makes a really great point. Um, you know, as designers, we disable people when we don't get it right. He always puts the disability on the responsibility of the people that design and build stuff. Um, you know, we're all an incredibly diverse group. We have impairments, depending on your perspective. We have disabilities, depending on your not well conditions. You know, and but you know, depending on whether you can get a wheelchair in through the front door or not, was dependent on the architect deciding whether they were going to put steps in. If they decided not to put steps in, they make it accessible by putting steps in. They're already breaking the environment for someone. These, it's you know, just having the idea of building this building meant it was equally accessible because all it was was a concept, and everything they did between then and actually opening the building created the accessibility problems. It's all about the process. So I stop things from getting in the way of Jamie doing his job, and I'm going to talk about seven or eight of them, I think, now. I'm hoping I've got the right number. I, one of the first things I think as a manager of Jamie or a manager of anyone is you need to take a holistic approach. What happens outside of work and what happens at work can be blurred. Um, we have to do a lot of planning. I get a, involved as much as Jamie wants to me. Jamie is, uh, he, he doesn't use the word independent in the way he lives. Um, uh, and this is an ADHD brain uh, now I cannot remember the word that he uses. I know what it means. I can't describe it. But he makes all the decisions about his life. What is, what is that word? I've got the word ag autonomous. autonomous. There we go. Thank you very much. The, the next time I'd remember that is four o'clock in the morning and I'd wake up and shout autonomous and my wife would be going, what? <laughs> Explain. Um, but that's, thank you very much. Uh, you can heckle at any point, by the way. Thank you. So we, I regularly meet with his, his you know, support group uh, and uh, you know, Jamie hires and fires his support. He builds his support up around him of the people that he knows and trusts, knows that he can work with, they know Jamie. Um, you know, we regularly, I go off to BBC Romford, which is what we call his flat, um, because he works a lot from home. Um, and uh, you know, I meet with people, we sit down, we talk about stuff. We know such and such a date there's going to be a haircut, such and such a date there's going to be dentists. You know, and, and we know that for the days after that there's going to be problems and so we make arrangements around it. And you have to make those kind of, you, you have to open that up. This is why I'm paid for. This is why I'm a manager. Yeah, whether the day is going to be successful or not, it's probably been already decided by 9 a.m. Um, this is one of the things I've found out as well. Uh, again, this is all just basically working with people. One of the things Jamie used to do was come into the office every single day because that's what everyone else did. Um, when I first met Jamie, Jamie was spending way too much of his energy uh, trying not to be autistic. And, um, but for the, for the benefit, what he thought of everyone around him. And to be quite frank, it was breaking him and the commute was breaking him. And, you know, it was one of those, um, you know, well, the commute breaks anyone. I absolutely can't stand travelling around London, which is why I don't live there. Uh, I live out in, in Lancashire. Um, I, I really love cities. I just don't like the crowds, and I don't like that sudden push and, the, and, and everything. It's overwhelming, and for him, he's got huge sort of sensory shock issues. It's, it's just in, unbearable. And, uh, you know, so you turn up and that would be it. It'd be a write-off for the day. And I know that I've got this absolutely brilliant member of my team who can't work because he feels like work demands him to fit within a certain framework. We also have chats regularly in the morning about elephants and spoons. Now, elephants, I know, is a particularly Jamie thing. Has anyone come across spoon theory here? Yes, there's a couple of two, three, four hands. You all need to look it up. It's brilliant. Spoons are our social currency. We start the day with so many uh, spoons, and social interactions and various different things take spoons away. And when we're running out of spoons, we decide this is the point where we get away from people, away from the stressful stuff. We get into a quiet space. We do some stuff that, because there are some activities that give spoons back. And we manage stuff around spoons. I'm not quite sure how many spoons we have. We, it seems to be like some, a lot, none. Um, and, uh, but we, we, at least it gives us a dialogue around that kind of social interaction. It's incredibly invaluable knowing how many spoons Jamie has got because then I know whether or not how much support he needs from me or how much support he doesn't need from me at that point. Elephants are an anxiety currency. Um, I think, you know, the, that feeling of compression you have on your chest when you're feeling anxious. I think Jamie was quite young. He didn't understand what that was, and it was like having an elephant sat on him. 
And uh, we're not quite sure whether they're big elephants or, or, or whatever, but you know, we know that, that however many elephants there are, this is, this is not good. Uh, or this is a good place, the elephants are not around at the minute. And we talk about elephants, we talk, we must confuse the hell out of people who are sat around us. It's like, for the last 10 minutes, those guys have just been talking about elephants and spoons, and they seem to be, it seems to be quite constructive. <laughs> is this a new BBC service? Um, <laughs> cutlery and <laughs> pachydermy, how does that work? Um, but these, these kind of conversations, this kind of communication is incredibly important. And this is the stuff in the beginning of the day. We understand what we, we can, our expectations are of the day and how to manage it. The desk. <sighs> Having a desk is a problem. Um, so in some ways, it's not a problem. It's a great place. It's a st place where you can go and it's always there and it's always yours and it's set up the way that you need it. As long, don't, you know, if someone can't cope with hot desking, don't ask them to hot desk. Um, you can set the environment up incredibly, incredibly well, but the thing is, it, it, even then, the concept of then having to be there and, and keeping that structure may not be a great thing. You know, office environments, which is part of the BBC, is, it, they can be incredibly busy and overwhelming and, and you know, sort of sensory nightmares. Um, and, you know, and we have huge open plan, busy spaces with, you know, I think, 18,000 members of staff across all our places and, and it, it's, it's a lot it's a lot to ask for even when we were doing sort of you know the, the seating plan of where we we're going to put Jamie and on the right hand side was a really busy corridor so we, which is in the open plan so we need to avoid that space he needs to have a clear place to it which is a quieter bit which was actually next to a window on the left but that comes from that route took him through to the toilets, the lifts, the kitchen, wherever he needs to be, and he can avoid that busyness over that side. He had a wall behind him so people weren't moving behind him. He had people either side of him that he knew, but he also had barriers around him. You know, it's those kind of things. We thought about this at the time. We tried to make it work. Um, we gave up on this for having a desk uh, a long time ago. But, you know, for some people it can be made to work, and you need to do that exploration around it. And this was the thing that really finished us off, the light. Um, one of those. Who, who here works with ceiling lights? I know everyone knows what a ceiling light... Don't show your hands. <laughs> I know you all know what a ceiling light, sorry. Um, but when it came down to it, even after we'd made all the adjustments that we needed to make, we found that the ceiling lights were breaking in. Um, they were fluorescent tubes, which can be massively problematic. Um, and so... My thought was, well, why don't we just remove the one that's directly above his desk that he can directly see? And, uh, and you know what? We could do that. We could take it out. I went and spoke to everyone that was around him saying, you see that light there? Has anyone got a problem with us removing it? No one had a problem, so we took it out. It took me six months to stop them fixing this at night. <laughs> Every time we came in, <laughs> those magic people overnight had gone around going, light bulb's gone, and literally, it's not there. <laughs> And they fixed it. There was no process to stop them replacing it. It's in the contract. Light's broken. Get replaced. Eventually got to the point where um, we ended up moving anyway, it seems. So the kind of problem went away and we, we decided to go into a more flexible home working kind of um, uh, arrangement. Uh, security. Uh, this, was a, this was a fun one. These things, we have them in all our buildings and you tap your pass on the top of it and in you go. We've got ones that have like swooshy doors and some of these that are turnstiles and things like this. Now, until he, I didn't know these were a problem until he came to uh, Salford to run a workshop uh, with an um, engineering team. And uh, he came up, at the journey had gone well. Came up from London. We planned so much with Virgin. Virgin are amazing. And, uh, you know, as an organization to work with around this. And we do so much planning. We under, we, and we, all, we work with the taxi company and various members of staff. So someone else is coming up that he knows and he sits with them. And we have certain policies around what we can book and how we can book it. Brilliant. We get him, to, get him all the way from his home, all the way to Salford, unbroken. And these broke him coming in through it. Because as soon as you went in too close to the person in front of you, they beep. And they beep so loudly. Sensory shock, it's like a light bulb going off in his, in his head. He virtually lost all his speech. Couldn't, he didn't even know how he'd got there. It wiped out the last few hours of his memory. He was, so he was completely distressed as, like, I am now in Salford and I have no idea how. You know, and so the afternoon was a write-off. 
Um, we ended up having a chat with Workplace. I wanted to find out if we had any hearing impaired security guards because they usually stood three, three feet away from these things. Um, and eventually we, we decided, the, you know, what would be a really good thing? Let's turn the volume right down <laughs> and still see if it beeps nice, gently. But security guard can still hear it. That's fine. So we didn't have an, a need for someone for, for it to be that loud. And the amount of emails we got afterwards from other people going, oh, that building I was avoiding. <laughs> And there were other people in the organization who were having a horrendous time with these things. And they were breaking other people. And, uh, and uh, it suddenly it made all the buildings accessible to Jamie again. This was, this, this was his steps and no ramp for getting in the building. My clothes. Um, this jacket. Uh, yes, I, I have two jackets. Jamie's facial blind. Um, so uh, he... <laughs> I hope I've got a yes. I have two jackets Jamie recognises, and uh, they're now become falling to pieces, and uh, this is the best one of the two. The other one is in right state. Um, I've had them for about five or six years. I wear them a heck of a lot, because otherwise Jamie doesn't recognise me, um, even though we know each other. But he says, yes, it's a combination of the two jackets, either that one or that one. They're the Gareth jackets, and I can't find any that look the same, because I know I'm going to get the wrong shade of brown if I get another one. Um, but my head is more flesh-coloured than most people's. Now, brutal honesty is something you're just going to have to live with as a manager. <laughs> I think we heard about that with the dress. I loved that. As, as feedback as the tent um, was absolutely brilliant. I get that kind of stuff on a daily basis. But it, that's brilliant. And often, actually, there's really good stuff in it. It's not... It's honesty. And, uh, and you know, I do feel every snowflake. I know that. Um, but, you know, that, that's great. Flexibility. I think I've already touched on some of this stuff as well. With Jamie, I don't talk about nine to five. We don't work in that kind of structured way. We work on his outputs. We work on goals. We sit and we sit and think about things that need to happen and need to be done. We just say, this week, that is a reasonable list of stuff to expect to be done within a week. I don't care whether he does this stuff at three o'clock in the morning. I care whether he phones me up at three o'clock in the morning to discuss it. <laughs> We've stopped that now. Um, <laughs> Wife again, we're going, I think that's Jamie. <laughs> That'll be Jamie. Um, and, you know, I'm up, we'll have a meeting. Um, and, uh, and that's fine. You know, again, as a manager, that's why I'm paid. Um, but we, you know, we work a little bit more structure around this and we build some rules in it and build a framework. But you know what? He then feels, he can see his achievement. Achievement, nine to five is not an achievement. <laughs> You know, time is not an achievement, output, you know, creativity and, you know, and, and, and achieving stuff, actually achieving stuff is achievement. You know, do you need to be in the office? We start this with a question around every single day. You know, he starts planning to come in and he's like, do you really need to do that? Can that be happened over the phone? Can we do that in another way? Do you have to do that journey across London? You know, would it be better done, you know, sort of over Skype or whatever? You know, it, it, it's... Regularly, so much stuff, you don't need to be face-to-face -face with people to have a meeting. There's technology, folks. There's a whole internet and stuff on there. Use it. Huge tech companies spread across the world make this work. And, and yet, so many of us try and feel, well, I'm having a meeting. I've got to go and meet that person. You don't. You really, really don't. Um, and I think I've already touched on that. I already forgot. Yeah. So he doesn't work. He doesn't need to work standard hours. Um, I don't know how many hours Jamie works a week, but I don't do timesheets and things like that. We do it. And I know I've worked with people who work longer hours than Jamie and achieve far less. So, you know, I, so which one is doing it right and which one is doing it wrong? Communication. A good communicator. Now, how many of us have got those words in our job description? You know, it, and how many of us are working jo in jobs or are there jobs out there where communication isn't really needed? You know, to be quite frank, someone who works in quality assurance as a tester or a software engineer is sat in a dark corner over there with their headphones on getting on with their job. They're not communicating on a daily basis with people. They're focusing on what they need to do and they're building stuff and being amazing and being brilliant. So why is that in their job description? Why is that putting them off applying for that job? Because they might think, I really struggle communicating one-to-one -one with people, therefore I cannot do this. We have to think about the language in the way that we describe stuff. This is before we even get people in through the door to try and give them 
you know, an interview or a way of evaluating whether they would be suitable for it. By the way, interviews, nightmare, horrible things. You know, Jamie never did one. He sat literally in a room and people in radio music gave him a technical problem and said, let's give you an hour, see what you come up with. And he came up with an approach they'd never seen before. And they went, right, okay, he knows his subject. He's obviously got, he's an incredibly creative thinker. Um, you're in. <laughs> you know, it's for a three-month trial period. Let's see how things work out. And he's, he's been here ever since. So, you know, really, you know, really think about it. Oh, yes, and communications. This is, this is uh, Slack. There are other tools available. But there, Slack is an amazing... Uh, has anyone come across Slack? There's one, two, three, four hands in the room. Slack is brilliant and there, but there are, there actually are. There are other pr sort of project management and other types of tools out there online that you sign up for as a team. We use Slack a lot. Now Jamie a few years ago uh, had an operation and he came out of, that took all of us an enormous amount of organisation to get him into the hospital and to get him through this and it really was actually a life saving operation in the end. Um, but he came out non-verbal. He was non-verbal for 18 months. Now being non-verbal comes with all sorts of issues. So he had his AAC and he could talk, but in team meetings, it meant that every time Jamie wanted to say something, he had to put his hand up, everyone had to stop, he had to type it out, said it, we all then responded, and the conversation then moved on at 100 miles an hour again, and then he had to try and stop everyone every time he wanted to, you know, again. And there was no flow, there was no, it was not a meeting in a, in a, on an equal footing. So I introduced a rule that when we meet as a team, we're all silent. And we all, we had silent team meetings and we used to sit and we used to type on this. I discovered this way I was the slowest typist in my team. I became the impaired one. Um, and they were very kind slowing down for me. And, and so, but it meant the conversation flowed. It meant we could all input together. It also meant I had a three month record of everything that everyone had said. <laughs> And it also meant they had a three-month record of everything that I'd promised them. <laughs> so, <laughs> it, incredibly useful. We now, and I've, I've been on the phone at the back, actually. I've got it on my phone. I've got, I've got the app here. We're chatting away. I've just been chatting to Jamie, actually. Um, and uh, we do our team catch-up every single morning in this. You know, we're all spread. We're quite a, a split-apart team. We often go for days without seeing each other. We all work independently. But this way, we touch base every single morning. We talk about where we're up to. We help each other. We point stuff at people. We, there's other teams on here as well. So there's subject matter specialist areas. And we talk, and no one then feels isolated. Jamie can work at home and know he can talk to people immediately and get responses back. He can suggest something and help without having to go physically there to help them. Find tools. There are lots of other ones out there. Find those kind of tools that make this possible. Decompression. This is the last one. Um, when we do things like he does a bit of public speaking or we go to a workshop or we do an away day, people don't realise that actually at the end of the day that takes a certain toll. There is always a price to pay for those kind of things, and I have to take that into consideration. He has to take that into consideration. And you know what? The value of doing the stuff is worth the time out afterwards. But we plan the decompression, and we're quite creative around how we do it and how we work out where the cutoff points are, and we have a continuous dialogue around this. I mean, Jamie will talk to a room of four or 500 people in Sweden, which is what the last that um, slide of him earlier was. Um, and we'll be there for two days. I know the next three days are going to be a massive, massive struggle. And so we temper the work around what we know we can do. He still wants to contribute, but we set realistic goals around it. Um, we had an all uh, UX away day in, in Salford. 200 members of staff turned up. Lots of workshops and stuff and bits and pieces. Jamie was uh, running his VR lab in the morning. And to be quite frank, he was massively overwhelmed. And I just thought, right, the afternoon's a write off. If I keep him here, we're going to end up with a broken Jamie. And so the Music M Museum of Science and Industry was just down the road. And here they've got Alan Turing's first ever electronic computer, the one he built after Colossus. Um, this was a calculator called Baby, and they've restored it. And they run it, they fire it up quite regularly. Unfortunately, it wasn't running that day. You need two engineers because she regularly uh, electrocutes them. Um, so you need another one to un switch it off so they unstick them. Um, but Jamie turned up. Jamie ended up having a two-hour conversation with this guy who's a retired software engineer. And Jamie knew about as much about the system as he did. And he's like, I never get questions like this. <laughs> this guy's brilliant. Who is he? Why has he got a lion? Um, <laughs> 
absolutely fantastic. This is spoon restoring stuff. And then by the end of the afternoon, we're sat, we're talking, we're back working again. He can then deal with the journey home. He can deal with stuff. Decompression is part of your, you know, sort of management role within, you know, so this person's working life is an incredibly important thing. You know, you have to think about it. And you have to turn around sometimes and saying, you're pushing yourself too hard. If we don't do something as an activity, it's going to go, it's just, you know, we know how this is going to end. And so you're responsible as well for as much as, as bringing that decompression moments into, into the daily uh, working practices. I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of my, my this is, I'm really near the end now, and uh, talk about a couple of my colleagues, um, Lena Hack and Sean Gilroy. Has anyone come across these two? Or This is the best picture I could find of them. It happened to be in The Guardian. There are other newspapers available. Um, <laughs> but... Um, I love The Guardian. There are so many leaks from the BBC to The Guardian. If you ever want to know what's going on in the BBC as a member of staff, you pick up a copy of The Guardian. Uh, <laughs> it's usually there first. Um, so these two, this is in Salford, they run a, 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 an, um, a, a, an amazing project internally in the BBC. They're actually um, cognitive designers within, within UX. Um, but CAPE is a thing where they're building you know, sort of guidelines and stuff about the way that we design our physical environments. They're looking at our employment and looking at it as a service design perspective at the, our employment practices um, around uh, sort of neurodiversity. And, um, uh, and one of the things that is going to be coming out quite recently is we, we've ended up all of the stuff that we now know about environments, environmental spaces and the way we design our working spaces. They're pulling into a website. It's going to be available quite soon on the BBC GEL site, which is the global experience language, the UX language of the BBC. Um, I, I'll, I'll try and pass it to Adrian as soon as it goes live and send it around to people. It's not the Bible on how to build, but uh, as soon as this goes live, this is a, it's an incredibly useful tool, and it's the way that we're now with the, the evaluation tool. We're now looking at all of the ways that you know the BBC building in Cardiff, which is opening up quite soon. They've been using this. Any refits that are happening within any spaces. Internally, this becomes that kind of thing of, are we considering this? And even though it's not the, you know, the job done thing, it gets the conversation going as well. And with all these things, they're living documents. Pardon me. And, uh, you know, sort of every time they're applied, the feedback that comes back with it will help evolve the document because we'll find out new things because all spaces are slightly different. But that's one thing I hope as a, as a resource that might be useful to you. If you know anyone who works in workplace or you're a manager, this stuff, sort of stuff is uh, valuable. So sort of summarising some of the stuff we talk about is as a manager, you know, take responsibility as a manager uh, to fix the fixable. And most of this is fixable. Um, you just need to really get underneath it and get quite creative about the way you work. work. Be creative, collaborative and flexible. Enable communication, like Slack, like using AAC, like using other ways of doing stuff. Um, communication is so important. People need to have a voice at work, even if they have no voice. And make the plans together. So, you know, I don't do this as a manager. Jamie and I do this together as a team. Um, you know, he has, we have an equal role within this. I need to know where the problems are, together we discuss of what the potential fixes are, I then go and try and implement them. And, and that dialogue means we have a great working relationship and despite the fact that I'm the most disorganised person on the planet, um, you know, <laughs> and, and again, he really needs structure, we've taught each other a lot. Uh, and I've grown in my skill set as a manager and become more organised and better, a better communicator and more concise in my communication. And, and Jamie's become more flexible and more open to ambiguity um, and all the rest of it. So we, we end up benefiting each other. Uh, thank you very much.